If I believe the world were to end tomorrow, I would still plant a tree today. Historically, that quote comes down to us from Martin Luther, the great reformer, even though he very likely did not <coughs> say it. But the prophet Jeremiah did just this morning, and he took it a step further. Jeremiah acting as God's mouthpiece to the displaced Jewish exiles who had seen their homes ransacked, who had been carried off into lands unknown, who were sitting under the thumb of an oppressive regime, said the same thing, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat from them, have kids and grandkids and build lives that are worth living. If you happened to be at Shrinemont a few weeks ago and stayed for the Sunday service, you heard Reverend Fran from St. Thomas preach a truly masterful sermon on the prophet Jeremiah buying the field in Anathoth and how this was an act of public theology, an action that spoke to God's nature and God's commitments in the world. And this is the same thing we're looking at today, Jeremiah's exhortation to plant trees at the end of the world is an act of public theology. Lots of prophets in the Hebrew scriptures do the overt acts of public theology thing. I like to think of them as ancient performant artists who uh, would do these seemingly wild things to comment on the current state of their culture and society. Ezekiel laid on his side for 400 days straight and cooked his food over fires made from refuse and waste to show the people of Israel and Judah what they had been reduced to in their unfaithfulness to the covenant with their God. The prophet Hosea named his son and his daughter unloved and not my people, which, apart from being questionable baby names, uh, showed that even when the Israelite people disowned their God, their God would not disown them. And Jeremiah, the weeping prophet himself, the youngest of the bunch, bought a field, a burned out husk of a field that he would never see brought to harvest because he understood that God was going to make all things new that God was going to bring the exiles back, that God was going to restore the fortunes of his people and give them a new chance at life. Here in our passage today, we see Jeremiah encouraging these exiles to bloom where they're planted. That is, uh, of course, overly simplistic and reductionistic, possibly unhelpful, as these people were exiles. They weren't planted at all. They were uprooted and set down somewhere completely new and unwelcome. They were exiles who'd had their entire lives pulled out from under them, who felt as if their God had abandoned them, who were reeling from the loss of everything that they'd ever known and felt would never go away. They're the ones to whom God is handing down this impossible feeling task in the midst of all this chaos and destruction. How can you possibly do something like plant a tree or build a house or see hope for the future at all when everything's cast in the shadow of suffering and grief? Hopelessness, despair, exile, grief, suffering, whatever we name it, the shadow that it is covers everything. And what do we do then? What do we do when there is no hope to be seen? <laughs> when it all seems like we're on the precipice of losing everything or we already have? What do we do when the big stuff, despair, hopelessness, exile, the threat of nuclear war, or an impending climate crisis, or the fact that there are places in this world, in this country even, that don't have safe water to drink? This too big stuff, when it comes and it will or it has, what do we do? Now, there's no easy or clean answer to that at all. There's no clean or easy answer because our lives aren't easy or clean. Our present reality isn't easy or clean. It just isn't. That's not how it works. But how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. When I was growing up and would get overwhelmed about whatever, uh, which happened a lot as I am a very anxious human being, my mom would sit me down and she would tell me to just do the next right thing. The next right thing. There's some real practicality there. The big picture was just too big, but I could see the next step in front of me and I would take it. And I could see the next step after that and I would take it and the next one and the next one and the next one. And there's something so practical about Jeremiah's direction to these Israelite refugees, isn't there? Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat from them. 
Create a life for yourself and for those who come after you, a life worth living. Fight like your life depends on the hope that someday you might have hope, because it very well might. It's a to-do list that he gives them, and it's all worth doing. Planting trees and building homes, building lives, these are all acts of resistance and defiance in the face of despair. These acts, some small, some incredibly large, every one of them is about believing somehow, some way, that things can get better than they are now. They're full-throated shouts of hope in the face of despair, believing or hoping to believe that even if it looks like everything is going to hell in a handbasket, there is still hope because no matter how desperate or hopeless it seems, our God has not abandoned us. Because, and I'll quote Paul here from our epistle this morning to Timothy, even when we are faithless, even when it seems like all hope is lost, when our faith has all but dissolved or it has dissolved, and there is no good that could ever come from anything. Even then, our God remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. It's just who God is. And there may come times when, in spite of everything or because of everything, we can't see hope. We couldn't muster a whisper or a thought of hope in the face of despair, let alone a full-throated shout. That happens. That's reality, too. In J.R.R. Tolkien's Return of the King, there's a point where Sam and Frodo are sitting in the shadow of Mount Doom, deep in the heart of Mordor, hidden on the plains of Gorgoroth. I know, we all know this, of course. (laughs) On the brink of losing all hope. Frodo Baggins is exhausted from his burden of carrying the One Ring, and Samwise Gamgee is exhausted from his burden of carrying Mr. Frodo. And as they were settled in among some rocks, trying to find some small comfort and sleep, Sam, full of despondency and despair, looked up and there, Tolkien writes, there, peeping among the cloud rack above a dark tor high up in the mountains, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked up out of the forsaken land, and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Now, I don't share that this morning because I think that we will see a star so beautiful that it will tear our hearts in two. Or because I think that eventually everyone will have that one thought that pierces them clear and cold and hope will suddenly return or even because I'm a big old Tolkien fan and I'm just psyched I found a way to work it into my sermon. (laughs) I share it because there have been times for me when reading that passage, that exact little chunk, have been the sort of single shining star twinkling above the mountains of doom in my life. Seeing for me that this character, this fictional character, sure, yeah, but a character that I had genuinely come to care about, seeing that he had some shred of Hope, belief, or faith that all was not lost afforded me some shred of hope, belief, faith that all was not lost. And sometimes that secondhand hope, that's all we got. Sometimes seeing people we love and care for, fictional or not, seeing people who matter to us and us to them have some sort of hope in the face of despair, seeing them plant a garden and harvest it or build a life worth living and living it seeing a friend get a job that they have been needing, or watching a coworker be so proud of their kid over something that wouldn't matter to anyone who was not that kid's parent, or being present to a family member having the courage to be their full self for the first time. Sometimes these small acts of defiant hope in the face of an otherwise indifferent and despairing world are all we got. It is secondhand hope, but it can be enough. So even in those moments when, like Martin Luther, Jeremiah says, even in the moments when the world may very well end tomorrow, we plant that dang tree in the defiant hope that it'll grow. And that tree could be an actual tree, sure, yeah, why not? Or a relationship that needs some growth and tending, or something that depends on you for its growth, so you gotta stick around to keep it going. And the house could be an actual house, yeah, or a legacy, a life of doing good work in the world, 
Or maybe the house is a place where we can humanely and realistically live with the sorrow, with our suffering and our lives still intact. Not denying the reality of that suffering, but experiencing it in its fullness and waking up the next day, believing, knowing that God will meet us there. The acts themselves are secondary to the hope with which they're done and the God to whom they bear witness. And the God we serve is faithful. Our God can't be anything but faithful. It's God's very nature. He cannot deny himself. Acting in a way that communicates the very nature of God, acting in a way that plants trees and builds houses, builds lives worth living in places that are broken, in places that don't have fertile soil or strong foundations, is a witness to the true reality of the world, to the true nature of the God who loves us and gave himself up for us. We act in ways that say, this is not as good as it can get. There is something better coming. Because that same God who loves us and gave himself up for us on a cross 2,000 years ago is the same God who could not be bound by the grave and three days later walked free and is the same God who has promised to return again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. His kingdom where the last shall be first and the first shall be last and where there is no more sorrow, no more pain, no more despair or misery or exile or grief or suffering where every tear will be wiped from our eyes. That kingdom is the reality that we bear witness to when we act in defiant and resistant hope, planting that tree even when the world, our world, has ended. And this is not some sort of prosperity gospel that says if we have enough faith or enough hope that everything will get completely better and that it'll all be good. Not that at all. In our planting and building and living, we witness a new world that is coming and is not yet here, but it is coming. We know it's coming because we can see glimpses of it. We can be part of the glimpses of it. And because our God promised that it would come and he's good for it. Our God is faithful. Our God has always been faithful, will always be faithful, even when we're not, even when we can't be, because that's who he is. He remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Amen.